when you dropped her off that day, do you mm. remember the last thing you said to her? I did. I remember, told her I loved her and I'll see her soon. And it never happened. The death of an innocent woman at the hands of a well-trusted physician. Staff members commanded to not call 911. A slew of lies engineered to hide the patient who lay dying in cardiac arrest. And the operation? It was a low-risk procedure, so how exactly did she die? The answer goes back to that same surgeon, the man who was playing God. The man who, for whatever reason, watched his innocent patient suffocate to death on his operating table. And she died slowly, for over three hours. But every killing has a motive. This is the tragic story of Megan Espinosa's unjust death and the man who let it happen. It was the 19th of December, 2018. Megan Espinoza, a 36-year-old mother of two and kindergarten teacher, was preparing for breast augmentation surgery. She had her anxieties, but based on her doctor's many credentials and the overall comforting atmosphere of the Divino Plastic Surgery Center, she assumed that her fears were momentary. Before going into surgery, Megan received a text from her brother. It read, I'm sure that everything will be fine, and I'll talk to you after this, it reassured her. After all, it is a low-risk surgery for most people. Dr. Carlos Chacon, a plastic surgeon working in Bonita, California, had a great record when Espinosa started researching clinics. She wanted someone reliable, with a good record, and an established facility. And that's exactly who Chacon appeared to be. Chacon graduated from the University of Arizona's medical school and had been a university fellow prior to opening his own practice. He had a great record and multiple publications which indicated his expertise. Magazines and specialist publications alike went to him for advice. His numerous papers included practice guidelines for procedural sedation, patient management, and how to conduct consultations and surgery aftercare. He founded Divino Plastic Surgery in 2012 with a mission to provide patients with high-quality reconstructive and plastic surgery. According to the center's website, Divino took great care in educating patients and supporting them throughout their procedures. One of the things I like about plastic surgery is that we're able to take what we've learned and really provide people with the contour and the body and the shape that they want that will really provide them with the confidence and the beauty that they've been looking for in order to really conquer their dreams. Only in retrospect, Chacon's publications would end up being contradictory to Chacon's actions. And his apparently pristine moral compass? Nothing short of non-existent. So six days before Christmas 2018, Espinosa headed to Bonita for her long-awaited surgery. She was assured that it would all go to plan and that upon waking, she would have a newfound appreciation for her physical image. Chacon told her the licensed anesthesiologist would be present during the surgery. This did not happen. Instead, Dr. Chacon and registered nurse Heather Lang were the ones to administer Espinosa's anesthesia. She was injected with multiple substances prior to the procedure. But neither Chacon nor Lang were licensed to administer anesthetics. Carla Hernandez, an alleged surgical technician, was also present during the procedure. Hernandez had in fact pursued a business major for two years, but never graduated. She too was not certified to be a medical assistant. Zinha de los Santos was also present at the scene. De los Santos was similarly unqualified to act as medical personnel and was all the time a high school dropout with an incomplete GED. Once Espinosa was put under, the first implant of the mammoplasty was inserted, but something was starting to go wrong. Hernandez noticed a change in Espinosa's color, an indicator that her oxygen levels began to change. The surgical monitor began beeping its warning. Mid-surgery at around 2.20 p.m., Espinosa went into cardiopulmonary arrest. 
This means that her heart had stopped functioning normally. In the case of cardiac arrest, a lack of adequate and rapid medical care is certain to result in death. Chacon, a qualified medical doctor, was definitely aware of the gravity of this situation. Moises Espinoza, Megan's devoted husband, called the clinic at around 2.30 p.m. to check on his wife. But Chacon had instructed his employees to lie about the woman's condition, and Moises was reassured that his wife was just fine. An hour later at 3.30 p.m., Moises called the clinic again. He was met with the same response. At the same time, Megan Espinoza lay dying on Chacon's operating table. Between 3.15 and 5 p.m., while Megan Espinoza's critical condition worsened, Chacon consulted four other patients who were all unaware of the ongoing murder taking place in a neighboring room. Chacon also called two licensed anesthesiologists, Dr. Michael Den and Dr. Jesus Lozano, in order to ask for their advice. But Dr. Chacon lied shamelessly about Espinosa's condition. He told Lozano that the patient did not lose her pulse and that her blood pressure remained stable. Lozano offered to come into the clinic and assist the surgery, but was refused. Chacon called Dr. Den at 4.49 and at 5.03 p.m., once again hiding the fact that Espinosa's heart had stopped. Even with just a partial awareness of what Espinosa was going through, Den strongly advised Dr. Chacon to call 911. The patient needed to be intubated. Chacon refused. He also instructed his employees to not make the call. Finally, a 911 call was made at 5.24 p.m., three whole hours after Espinoza had gone into cardiac arrest. The district attorney's warrant states that Chacon seemed robotic on the phone, as if he wasn't concerned. He described the patient as not following commands. He said, she's not following commands. She's being bagged. She's, you know, waking up from anesthesia. Her eyes are open. She's making movements and moaning. Well, that's what we have. Moises Espinosa was only told about his wife's condition 20 minutes later at 5.41 p.m. When emergency services arrived at the scene, Espinosa was immediately intubated and transported to a hospital. Her condition was critical. A chest tube was inserted into the patient whose pulmonary condition ended up improving over the following five days but her neurological condition remained critical. Even if Megan Espinosa were to ever wake up, she would never be the same woman as before. On the 24th of December, Espinosa was transferred to a neurological intensive care unit, but her condition continued to deteriorate. At this point, Espinosa's family was told that she would never regain neurological function. Espinosa was soon placed on palliative care and passed away on January 28, 2019. An autopsy concluded that Espinosa died due to ischemic encephalopathy caused by a lack of blood flow and oxygen to the brain. Her death could have been prevented, or rather, her murder could have been prevented. But Chacon, Espinosa's murderer, continued practicing in spite of the incident. Power hungry, greedy, and determined to continue his negligent practice, Chacon kept luring in patients desperate for his help, and not long after Espinosa's death came another victim. Natasha Luis was won over by Chacon, who promised her a full mommy makeover. He actually recommended a full mommy makeover. So with the mommy makeover, he was including breast. He would uh, lift my breast. He would take in my stomach, take the fat from my stomach and put it on my butt. She was impressed by Davino's staff and facilities and by its cleanliness. She found Chacon to be very charming and he seemed to really know his stuff. Luis was sold. Natasha's surgery took place on April 6, 2021. Upon waking up from her anesthesia, Luis was directed to sit in a wheelchair. Still feeling the effects of the injections and trying to regain her walking abilities post-surgery, Luis fell and injured her right side. The next day, Luis, a qualified nurse, noticed that something was off. Bruising is a normal side effect of surgery. But why was her right breast bruised much worse than her left? Concerned, Louise told Chacon about it, but was told not to worry. 
After a few more days passed, Louise started noticing that a patch of skin on her stomach appeared to be dying. She booked another appointment with Chacon, who cut away the dead skin, and told Louise that the patch would soon heal with no bruises. They cut that skin out and uh, told me that it's okay, the skin will heal. But it didn't heal. Luis had to keep coming back in with the same problem. Came back in a couple of days and they cut more of the skin and they repeated the cutting of the skin for a few weeks. The hole ended up starting off around this size and then ended up being about this big. Chacon kept cutting away at Luis's freshly operated stomach. Over time, this repeated procedure resulted in a jagged hole in Luis's stomach, which never appeared to heal. Chacon assured Luis that he would fix her stomach once it healed over, and she set up an appointment with him for several months into the future. It was at that point that a Divino employee whispered in Luis's ear, suggesting that she research Chacon a little more deeply before booking any more consultations with the doctor. And I was horrified. Espinosa's death stuck in her mind as glaring evidence that she had been lucky. She had gone under the knife of a killer. I pride myself on being smart and independent and it just made you feel so stupid. So stupid. In an interview, Luis said, no one stopped him after things started happening. No one stopped him, and he continues to be in business, and he continues to hurt people, and it could have been stopped. It was only several months after Luis's botched surgery that the Medical Board of California finally took action against Jacone. In December, the board recommended that disciplinary action should be taken against Jacone. Their justifications included alleged gross negligence, repeated negligent acts, failure to maintain adequate and accurate records, incompetence, aiding and abetting the unlicensed practice of medicine, unprofessional conduct, false advertising, and dishonest corrupt acts. The court also ordered the surgeon's license restricted as a condition of bail. As a result, Chacon admitted that prior to Espinosa's surgery, there was no discussion with the patients regarding the absence of an anesthesiologist. But these measures still did not stop Chacon from practicing. In fact, in spite of the vast number of charges against the surgeon, it seemed that the law kept protecting him. Chacon was still not required by law to inform any prospective clients of his charges or restrictions. But the law enforcement's reaction regarding the California Medical Board's accusations were found to be far from enough. Even with those accusations looming over Chacon, he was still allowed to continue practicing. He was also not obliged to tell any prospective patient of his accusations. This meant that anyone considering Chacon would not have known about Espinosa's death unless they specifically researched Chacon's history of malpractice. Espinosa's family and Natasha Luis's alike were in shock over the lack of measures being taken against a man with a record of maltreating patients. And why did the world only learn about Megan Espinosa's murder three whole years after it happened when the California Medical Board finally publicized the details of her death? Months passed until further measures against Chacon were taken. Months in which Chacon still practiced, putting even more lives at risk not even the mounting charges against him could stop the money-hungry surgeon. On March 18, 2022, the Arizona Medical Board restricted Chacon's license. They had the power to do so since Chacon had graduated from their medical college. As the criminal case evidence against Chacon built up, the doctor was finally arrested at his office in early April 2023. During his initial court hearing, Chacon pleaded not guilty to all charges. His attorneys even insisted that Espinosa's death should not be discussed as a criminal matter and should be in civil court instead. According to them, this was a case of malpractice on Chacon's side and could not be deemed as second-degree murder. 
civil case. It should not be a criminal case. There's nothing in Dr. Jacone's conduct that rises to the level of being charged with a second degree murder. Uh, this is this is a tragic accident. It's misfortune. And, you know, at best, it's a negligence case, which has already been settled. But the prosecution had evidence for Chacon's negligence, his lack of empathy and care for Espinoza. He can't be providing life-saving treatment to the victim on the table when he's in uh, his practice seeing other patients. So we've, we found that to be extremely egregious. And his gross dishonesty during the incident. All of these aspects should amount to manslaughter charges. Investigators discovered evidence that Chacon had a history of dangerous and negligent behaviors, including cutting corners, using unlicensed, unqualified employees, and putting the safety of his patients at risk to make more money. The judge set a number of conditions for Chacon's release. Amongst them were the following. He may only perform surgery if anesthesia is performed by a licensed anesthesiologist or a licensed CRNA, that's a certified registered nurse anesthetist who is licensed to administer anesthesia independently without supervision of a physician. He may only perform surgery in a licensed certified outpatient surgery center or hospital. He may not direct unlicensed personnel to administer anesthesia, IV meds, or service IV bags in any manner. He must notify the court if he intends to travel outside of the state of California, and he must inform surgical patients of the pending charges he is facing and must provide proof of that notification to the court. The district attorney's office recommended for Chacon's bail to be set at $5 million. But the judge reduced the bail to just 500000 a sum which the doctor could easily source and which he would soon pay and continue practicing. The Medical Board of California has filed a motion to have the doctor's license permanently suspended. But in spite of all the suffering Chacon has charged to multiple families and the danger he represents to prospective clients, he is, at the moment, still allowed to provide surgery. Chacon's preliminary trial hearing is set for June 5, 2023. Since Chacon's court hearing in April 2023, Central Valley State Senator Melissa Hurtado has come out criticizing the justice system for letting the surgeon run scot-free for so long. She said, I think that there's a big difference and a big concern here. It shouldn't take three years because three years is really a matter of life or death and not just for one, but for many patients. I think that, you know, things need to change drastically. This entire situation is incredibly troubling and a failure on the part of both the criminal system and the administrative system that's charged with protecting patients from harm. A 2019 survey from the Federation of State Medical Boards found that less than three in 10 Americans said that they know how to find out if a physician has ever received a disciplinary action against their medical license. Megan Espinoza should not have died on Chacon's operating table. Natasha Luis should not have returned from Divino plastic surgery with life-changing deformities. But their livelihoods and health were not prioritized by the justice system or by the medical boards in charge of identifying killers like Chacon. If there's one thing that could somewhat redeem the gross injustice which happened to Espinoza, it would be that Chacon is found guilty. Moises Espinoza said, I feel like my real closure will be when he's not practicing anymore. Did this video answer your questions? Did it pique your curiosity? At The Decoder, we compile all reliable sources in order to bring you the truth of true crimes. Your support is what keeps us going, so make sure you check out our many other videos. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so that you don't miss out on any of our upcoming videos. We'll see you next time on The Decoder.